Hello, everyone. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you have tuned in. And welcome to this side event jointly organized by the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, C2G, and the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, ISCA. My name is Xi Zhong and I'm the Outreach Officer with C2G. It's my pleasure to be the facilitator of this event today and I'm very much looking forward to it. To discuss about carbon dioxide removal and understand their role in reaching the Paris Agreement goals, the, their associated governance challenges and how those challenges uh, could be uh, addressed in the context of sustainable development goals. We today have a group of esteemed speakers to share their insights and perspectives on those issues. So first of all, I wish to introduce very briefly about C2G for people who are not uh, familiar with us. The Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative is a small and foundation founded initiative. Our mission is to catalyze the creation and the strengthening of governance for climate altering approaches in particular for solar radiation modification and large scale carbon dioxide removal. C2G is impartial with regard to the potential use or not of any of these proposed approaches or interventions. Those are the choices to be made by the society as a whole. On the other hand, we wish to contribute to and encourage uh, society-wide discussions and deliberation on those challenging issues by working with a number of stakeholders, including intergovernment organization governments and civil societies. So to that end, we partner with ASCAP to bring this issue to the region. Uh, I'm sure Stefanos will uh, speak in more detail about ASCAP's work on climate change and why he thinks that CDR, carbon dioxide removal, is relevant for the region. So coming back to, the, to our event today, uh, we have about uh, less than uh, 90 minutes. Uh, we'll start with a keynote speech and then there will be a panel discussion uh, which will be followed by a Q&A session with the participant. Um, in the end, we will have a very quick uh, wrap up. So without overdue, I will give the floor to uh, Stefano Spotu, the Director of Environment and Development Division of ISCAP. Um, Stefano, the floor is yours. See, thank you very much and a uh, very well, uh, warm welcome from my side to all the participants and very thank to you and also uh, my colleagues in, uh, in ESCAP, um, Aneta, that you have put together this um, event. I think it's uh, quite important to talk about um, a technology, a set of technologies actually, an approach the carbon dioxide removal uh, which it starts to be quite in the uh, forefront, I would say, on the discussion of climate action. And, and why this is important? Because um, we, we have seen in this region that uh, many of us were working and living for the, for the last years, that uh, it the climate change has a lot of substantial, substantive impacts in the region. The frequency and severity of the natural disasters, the climate-induced disasters, uh, it, it's, it intensifies. Um, we have really seen that um, we are not making any progress when it comes to delivering the sustainable developing goals. And this becomes a, a big challenge. And we do have assessments indicating that despite some current government commitments to reduce the greenhouse gases emissions, they, uh, they continue to rise and they are in a trajectory of warming of over three degrees Celsius and posting increasing risk. So this is extremely far away from the 1.5 degree that we want to achieve with the Paris Agreement. Um, and we have seen the impacts of climate change, not only in terms of disasters, but uh, the impact in different sectors. We have seen how agricultural productivity has been reduced in, in many areas uh, of Asia Pacific and in the world. And we have seen how this has also contributed to an increase, um, to, to, to a very big increase on the price of main agricultural commodities, making actually basic food more expensive for the poor. So um, a direct impact of climate change on increasing poverty and increasing the possibilities of having more hunger at a point that we try to completely uh, eradicate hunger. 
we are not in the region in any uh, possible track to achieve the SDG for 13 targets, the, the climate change uh, goal. The projected greenhouse gas emissions is to grow to 50 gigatons by 2060. And, and this actually shows that the nationally determined contributions are very far away and they are falling to support the Paris Agreement targets. So climate change and climate induced disasters, it's the two fundamental socioeconomic threats to sustainable development in Asia and Pacific. So there's a very big need to accelerate ambitious climate mitigation and adaptation to safeguard uh, the development gains that they have made the last decades and to rapidly transition towards uh, zero carbon equitable and climate and disaster resilient development as we recover from, the, from COVID-19 and make this recovery greener. So we, we have seen that, you know, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but the numbers are not in our favor. We have seen that we are nowhere to achieve the 1.5 degrees targets. We are increasing the greenhouse gas emissions. So allow me to, to say that we are a little bit desperate and we need to find any possible way to reduce the emissions. And this morning we had a very nice event on the interface of mitigation and adaptation. And I would say, okay, um, adaptation is happening but for how much we can adapt? At one point, we would not be able to adapt. So we need really to look at the mitigation seriously. So one um, of the measures that uh, we have put in the agenda to achieve the Paris Agreement is the carbon dioxide removal. Actually, if we see scenarios coming from IRENA, coming from other agencies that they are looking at the energy mix, we see that the carbon dioxide removal is part of these scenarios. And the IPCC also has started uh, making some work on uh, on this issue. Um, so in Asia Pacific, uh, we need to consider the carbon dioxide removal, but it's extremely important not to consider it as a substitute of climate action, but as a supplementary measure that we can intensify existing climate action. So we should not see the carbon dioxide removal as something that we should start doing because we will stop doing the transition to the green renewable energy, but something auxiliary that we should do it only if we have scientific certainty that it will create only positive impact. So the, the carbon dioxide removal, it, it looks to address the primary drivers of, of climate change by removing the carbon dioxide. And um, I would like to highlight three issues on why it is important to have this kind of discussion. And I would say it's important to have discussion discussion within the platforms and frameworks of the UN system and uh, this platform, the climate weeks that they are actually contributing to the COP, uh, to the climate COP. One is the big scientific uncertainty we have. So if we look at the IPCC reports, we see that there is a theoretical potential on reducing the greenhouse gases emissions, but at the same time, there's a lot of warnings about the potential negative impacts that this technology might have. Another thing is that even if we are in a position that we will have absolute scientific certainty that these technologies will not have any uh, negative impacts and will have only positive impact, there is a question on who is controlling these technologies because we will be talking about very big infrastructure projects, projects that they will be even uh, altering the way that we are doing business today. So who is going to control this? I'm, anytime I'm listening for the carbon dioxide removal and, and other uh, technologies like the solar radiation modification, I'm, I'm remembering a movie it's about more than 20 years ago. It's, it's, it's the first Avengers movie where you had the mad scientist there. It was the Sir Auguste de Winder, but the Winder was with a Y, and he was altering the weather. He could create storms, he could create um, droughts, he could create everything. So when you have a button uh, that you can do massive technological things and altering the carbon in the atmosphere, the question is who is, is having authority and who is having to control this button? Then the third point why the discussion is extremely important is because I think we need to go to the policy makers, uh, not with the complicated solutions and start talking to them a complicated science language, but we need to take all the scientific evidence and translate it to very concrete and applicable 
policy recommendations. And I think this is uh, something that it should come from science. All the policy recommendations should be science-based, but we need to look at the recommendations from the point of view of the policymakers, which are looking at the greater development issues, at the greater social issues, at the greater environmental issues. So we, we have the different CDR options. Um, many of them actually they have a lot of CDR options that they are na nature-based and probably we could start from there because probably these are the ones that they will not have a lot of negative impact. And it's essential to learn about these approaches and their potential benefits. And of course, the, the risk in the context of the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, and to ensure that implementation at national, regional, and international level maximize the synergies between these agendas and minimizes the trade off. So in, in ESCAP, the last two years, we have started a more systematic work on climate action we are working to identify what is the different levels of climate readiness of our member states and to support them on raising their climate ambition. And uh, to this end, in all the efforts we, we do to support mem our member states to raise our climate ambition, we are partnering with the C2D to increase the awareness of national and regional actors through this uh, event and through other events we have done before and will continue to do. Um, and let me also say that in collaboration with the C2G, we have launched a thematic area on climate altering approaches in the SDG help desk portal of, of ESCAP. Um, I would appreciate if the colleagues at one point they put uh, in the chat and, and they project probably the web page that uh, participants could um, uh, connect and see this, uh, this portal. And um, I want uh, to close by thanking all the, the panelists, the good colleagues that they have accepted to be in this uh, event today. I'm looking forward to a very productive discussion. Um, I have to apologize because I will not be able to stay for the wrap up as originally I was, uh, I was planning as I had a last minute emergency, urgent meeting, but I will be looking forward to uh, listen to this discussion and uh, hopefully take recommendations that we can get back to our member states. Thank you very much. And, Cheers back to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stefanos, for this very comprehensive uh, overview of um, um, the situation, uh, challenging, very challenging situation in the Asia Pacific region and how you see CDR's relevance for the region. And also, you pointed out very uh, important uh, governance uh, issues around these uh, uh, approaches or technologies, uh, uh, much appreciated. And also you, 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 you were able to make a link, uh, uh, a link with the uh, solar radiation modification uh, that we're working on as well, which we think is much more challenging than uh, carbon dioxide removal. And uh, of course, we look forward to working with ESCAP on, on those uh, uh, issues uh, as well. Now, um, we, we come uh, to the panel discussion. Uh, which will be moderated by a colleague from ESCAP, uh, Aneta Nikolova. Um, just a few words about the mechanics. Uh, all participants may tap in their questions in the Q&A uh, box of the Zoom interface. Uh, do, please do mention the name of uh, the speaker if your question is directed to a particular speaker, and please be short and clear. Uh, only those questions relevant to the theme of the event will be considered. We will try to answer as many questions as we can during the time we have. Uh, you may vote for the questions you like as the most popular questions have higher chances of being uh, addressed. Uh, so, uh, Aneta, uh, over to you now. Uh, also, I invite our, our panelists to uh, turn on their cameras and microphones. Thank you very much, G, and thank you very much, Stephanos, for giving us a heads up on the topic that we are going to discuss today. Um, this is very timely, as you mentioned, and uh, carbon dioxide removal um, in the framework of the Paris Agreement is a very important topic. Um, so with this side event, we will be able to hear um, different perspectives from colleagues um, from other UN agencies, UN regional commissions, other regions, and from civil society academia. So with that, I would like now to ask our panelists, uh, we have um, five very distinguished panelists uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, should I start with Detjen, please? Thank, thank you, Annette, uh, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, colleagues. 
I'm Dechen Siring. I'm the Regional Director for UN Environment Programme in Asia Pacific. And then we are moving forward to Joyce Roy. Yeah. Uh, I'm Joyce Sri Roy from Asian Institute of Technology in Thailand and uh, Jadapur University in Kolkata in India. I'm trained as an economist and then as environmental economist. One of my research focus is to understand how human actions in response to climate change um, can it be more synergistic to multiple dimensions of human well-being and sustainable development. Thank you very much. Luis, uh, Luis Krieger, our colleague from Latin American Commission. Can you introduce yourself? Thank you. You're muted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. I'm Luis Fernando Krieger. Please, I think the connection is not very good. We are not hearing you at all. Um, Colleagues, can you help support team? Yeah, sure. Maybe if you continue with the other speakers and then we'll see. Yes, how we'll come back to Luis. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Oliver, Oliver Geddon. Hello, my name is Oliver Geddon. I'm with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. The German abbreviation is SWP. Uh, this institute um, advises the German government and parliament on, uh, on foreign policy. Uh, I'm an expert on European Union climate policy, specifically on carbon dioxide removal. And uh, like Joe Ashbury, she did mention that uh, I'm also in the IPCC uh, in the upcoming team, in the team of the upcoming Working Group 3 report, uh, where I also work on carbon dioxide removal. Thank you very much. And then our, our last speaker on the list is uh, Jan Cairo Guillermo. Thank you so much. Good morning from Geneva. Um, I am Jan Carel Guillermo. I am from Leyte, Philippines. I am a survivor of the world's strongest typhoon back in 2013. And I'm also a former government official at a very young age. And currently I am interning as Secretariat of the Water and Climate Coalition in the World Meteorological Organization. Um, my, my work's focuses on using the arts and the, the, uh, the sociocultural behavior of the people in raising awareness about climate crisis. So, yeah, good morning again from Geneva. Thank you very much. And now um, I would like to start with our questions. Um, we have very, I'm very keen to hear from Mr. Chinsaring. What would you say about, we know about the ENAP uh, GAPS report and the IPCC findings and also the joint research we've done together on the NDC implementation review last year. So um, it seems that our region is off track and um, we know that there are potential negative impacts of CDR. So can you tell us about the role of CDR? How do you view that? Um, what is the advocacy UNEP is putting forward to supplement efforts to do net zero? Thank you very much, Atish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aneta. And uh, let me um, let me start with thanking the um, C2G and uh, UNSCAP for uh, inviting UNEP. I really wanted to focus um, a little bit today. We've already heard some of the statistics about the importance of uh, needing to look at carbon dioxide removals to achieve the temperature goals under the Paris Agreement. So when you talk about the IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade, and we're looking at um, limiting it to no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade, 
if carbon dioxide emissions reach net zero by 2050. I was talking to the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, and they had mentioned that 30% of the glacial lakes in the Himalayas would melt at 1.5 degrees centigrade. So we're really looking at uh, needing to remove emissions. With, so with the current nationally determined contributions, especially in the Asia Pacific region, it's gonna be inadequate to stabilize global temperature rise by 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. And when we look at the emissions gap report, we need, we've got figures that countries need to take a quantum leap in emission reductions, globally a 7.6% reduction every year from 2020 to 2030. And we need to have this reflected in the current nationally determined contributions of 2020. So we're needing to set really strong decarbonization targets and timelines to reach these targets. And of course, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees centigrade. When we look at carbon dioxide removal, we need to compensate for ongoing emissions in sectors that are hard to decarbonize for achieving peak warming around the time of net zero carbon dioxide emissions. So with the UNEP emissions gap report and other, other assessments have highlighted, um, they've highlighted a lot of risks associated um, with carbon dioxide reduction, such as permanency and adverse environmental impacts. The current global energy system um, you know, we're looking is highly carbon intensive with coal, oil, natural gas. That's currently meeting 80 5% of all energy needs. And if you look at a transition, if the transition doesn't occur, we're looking at increasing greenhouse gas emissions year on year. So it's important to review the different carbon dioxide removal options for sectors that are hard to decarbonize energy, such as steel and cement, which account for about 17% of total carbon dioxide emissions from energy and industrial sources. We know carbon dioxide removal options need to be considered along with other options. And we see many easy wins. I mean, renewable energy, energy efficiency. You look at um, electrification, um, policy measures for coal phase out for rapid decarbonization, the energy system. You look at decarbonizing transport and here the large um, air pollution co-benefits but if you look at some of the approaches under discussion and you talk about nature-based approaches such as enhancement of terrestrial and coastal carbon storage in plants and soils through afforestation and restoration, conservation, re restoration, management options for natural managed land and engineering-based approaches such as carbon capture and storage. We've seen many countries in the nationally determined contributions have stressed both mitigation and adaptation efforts. They've strongly linked them to sustainable national development. And we've seen that more than 70% of the NDCs cover agriculture, land use change, forestry options to reduce emissions of greenhouse gas by re reducing deforestation, forest degradation, conservation, enhancing forest carbon stocks, reforestation, reforestation, revegetation, and sustainable management of forest, soils, wetland restoration. We've also seen that while NDCs cover several nature-based approaches for carbon dioxide removal, only around 17% of NDCs have quantifiable and robust targets related to nature-based solutions. Similarly, although 70% of NDCs estimated references to efforts in the forest sector, only 20% of these include quantifiable targets. So this suggests that considerable potential remains for countries to set, strengthen the role of nature-based solutions in their nationally determined contributions. The benefits of taking action could not be clearer. We're finding that if you restore nature, reimagine re how we use it, it can deliver up to a third of climate action needed by 2030 to keep us within the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. Several countries in Asia and the Pacific region have also announced their carbon neutral targets, but they've not yet described how they will get to net zero. So um, it is important that carbon removal solutions are reviewed and considered while updating nationally determined contributions and carbon neutral targets. And if 
I also wanted to reiterate that carbon dioxide removal is not a replacement of emission reduction, but rather a complementary measure to achieve the Paris Agreement temperature goals. This option needs to be pursued along with scaling up renewable energy for electrification policy measures for coal phase out, for rapid decarbonization of the energy system and to decarbonize transport with large pollution co-benefits. So if I can end maybe um, UNEP and UNSCAP, uh, we co-chair an issue-based coalition on climate change mitigation and air pollution in the Asia-Pacific region. And we're looking at policy measures and we've done, we focused on coal phase out and the coal phase out working group has started to work in countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan and Vietnam. We've really focused on the efforts of actually the 15 UN agencies and um, the resident coordinators, the country teams, with a look to COP26. We've also started to do, there's been quite a lot of, in advance, in advance of COP26, members of the coalition are preparing regional progress review analysis and policy briefs on nationally determined contributions including the impact of enabling activities, also developing macroeconomic modeling of how carbon pricing instruments support emission reduction trajectories and socioeconomic development. But what we're finding is that many of the solutions are there. It's not coordinated approaches. Um, there's a lot that we can do together. The agencies, a lot of, you know, we're working with multilateral development agencies, with research institutions, we need to start to work to support countries to coordinate to coordinate approaches. But in terms of carbon dioxide removal, and if you look at, you know, the impacts of climate, climate change in the Asia Pacific region, we really have to explore all options, we'll have to explore all technological options, recognizing that there are, you know, governance issues. But we do have intergovernmental mechanisms for governance issues. So with this, Aneta, thank you. Thank you very much, Gretchen. This is uh, this is very, very interesting intervention. And of course, there's, um, and thank you for introducing the work of the um, IBC as well. And now I would like to give the floor to Jayashree Roy, please. Um, and uh, to ask you to respond to the following. Um, what do you think um, the potential for carbon dioxide removal te uh, technologies and techniques? Uh, what kind of uh, techniques that are possible to use the oceans uh, for carbon dioxide removal would you would like to mention and to consider here in your response? Uh, could you give us a quick review on proposed approaches? and how we could link CDR to the sustainable development goals I mentioned. Yeah, but I think I would start from the fact that we really need to consider that uh, CDR should not be looked at as a single standing action. It should be looked at uh, with other options. So when we have seen that it, this can be thought of for residual uh, emission uh, uh, management, right? So I would first like to highlight on uh, the mitigation options based on ocean system, and then would go for the uh, what it means for the CDR and what our findings say. So I, I do agree with the fact that oceans are the key defenders against climate change as they absorb 20 to 30% of the carbon emissions already. And we cannot forget that 70% of the Earth's surface is ocean. So ocean-based mitigation options, our studies show, could reduce the emissions gap by up to 21% on a 1.5 degree Celsius pathway. In our report of high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy in 2019, coordinated by the World Resources Institute, we reiterated the link between climate change, ocean health, and human well being. Estimates show ocean based mitigation options could reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by nearly 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per annum in 2030. 
and by more than 11 billion tons per annum in 2050, relative to projected business as usual emissions. And reductions of this magnitude are larger than the emissions from all current coal-fired plants running worldwide. So we defined actually five, five ocean-based climate actions, ocean-based renewable energy, ocean-based transport, coastal and marine ecosystems, the ocean-based food system, and carbon storage in the seabed. Ocean-based renewable energy production currently offers the greatest potential for delivering clean energy and reducing greenhouse gases, followed by ocean-based transport and then coastal and marine ecosystems. When wider impacts on environment and social well-being are considered, nature-based interventions in coastal ecosystem, especially protection and restoration of mangroves, seagrass and salt marshes offer the best combination of carbon mitigation and broader co-benefits. While innovation is required to improve many specific technologies and practices, four of the ocean-based climate actions are ready to be implemented today. These are the renewable energy, ocean-based renewable energy, marine shipping and transport, coastal and marine ecosystems, the ocean-based food system. This could offer many co-benefits in terms of creating jobs, improving air quality and human health, and supporting livelihood if implementation addresses trade-offs with sustainable development dimensions appropriately. Now, the environmental trade-offs and risks include the damage that can be done to coastal ecosystem or marine species by unplanned growth in coastal aquaculture or renewable energy installations. For example, mitigation options aimed at rebuilding fish stocks and other ocean biomass can negatively impact poverty reduction and employment targets and limit progress on food security targets in the short term. The analysis we also showed that all ocean-based mitigation options will need strong national institutions, engagement of business and industry, and community involvement and international cooperation to pursue the planned implementation and how it maximizes the positive impact and limits the negative impact on sustainable development dimensions. And we could not include uh, the, uh, the uh, ocean-based uh, carbon removal, di uh, 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 I mean, dioxide removal uh, quite uh, a lot because of a lot of uncertainty in the uh, current level of knowledge. You want to unmute, Anita? Yes, it happens with this environment. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for your fantastic intervention. And uh, we learned a lot about the potential for carbon sequestration from, from even from the use of the oceans, um, even when we do also renewable energy and the possible uh, risks when it is unplanned and it's too intensive. Thank you very much for that intervention. Now I would like to um, invite Luis Grieher, uh, our colleague from the Latin American Commission, uh, United Nations Commission, uh, Economic Commission, to present himself first and then <laughs> to also share with us, because now we can see him very well and I think we hear him very well, also to share with us the experiences of, um, I know you guys have done a report, um, a study on the potential of CDR use in Latin America. And if you could share a little bit with us the potential of the risks and, um, and positive uh, impacts of CDR. Thank you very much, Luis. The uh, floor is yours now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, sorry for my technological problems. I shift my, my uh, um, I'm using my, my phone and, and I, I think now it's working. Uh, well, it's, this is the, the, 
the thematic area that we are discussing here in this uh, event is really uh, very uh, important. And for, for us here in Latin America, in the Caribbean area, uh, given uh, that the emissions from, from agriculture, livestock, land use change and forestry are large in Latin America and the Caribbean, accounting for about half of the total emissions, uh, nature-based solutions represent a significant mitigation opportunity for us. Uh, and considering that the socioeconomic impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has led to an important recession in, in Latin American countries, this will require uh, reinforced action to achieve a recovery aligned with the Agenda 2030 and should simultaneously be inclusive, economically viable, and with a lower carbon footprint. This implies favoring uh, rising preferred sectors that can achieve those ob objectives and letting high carbon, low employment sectors sunset. This selective growth approach has been identified by ICLAC as a big push for sustainability that we have been using for, uh, for green recovery. This uh, big push for sustainability needs to be based on the coordination of technological, fiscal, financial, environmental, social and regulatory policies. It must aim to establish a new structure of incentives for investment and for the creation of higher productivity jobs and for the development of production chains. At the same time, it should result in a smaller environmental footprint and in the restoration of the productive capacity of the natural heritage, including its environmental services. Natural based solutions are therefore uh, an important tool for increasing the region's adaptive capacity since they reduce the impacts of climate change. For example, the protection, restoration or management of natural forests and wetlands in, uh, water, in watersheds, for instance, can secure and regulate the water supply and reduce the risk of floods and, and landslides as well as soil erosion. Of the methods already evaluated economically and environmentally, the most promising is the integration of crops, livestock, and forestry, called integrated systems, which combine fodder, grasses, and legumes with shrubs and trees for, for animal feed and complementary use. These systems enable production to be diversified and intensified on the basis of natural processes, using land more sustainably than in conventional farming. Ecological interactions increase productivity efficiency, the provision of environmental services, and ultimately the economic performance of properties. An important initiative to reduce the environmental impact and increase the efficiency of agricultural activity was done in Brazil, and it was called Low Carbon Agriculture Plan, which operated in the form of a credit line to finance changes in production methods and processes. The plan was a policy of agriculture agricultural intensification based on integrated systems, which operated on a large scale, which allowed, for instance, animal stocking rates to be increased from 0.7 units per hectare in degraded areas to, to five uh, uh, animals per hectare in areas with integration, a threefold increase in productivity and allowing these activities to be sink of carbon instead of a source of carbon. Thus, nature should be conserved and restored while nature-based solutions for disaster risk uh, reduction in climate action should be accelerated. Nature conservation and ecosystem restoration provide a range of direct benefits for producers, communities, local authorities, and the private sector, including the creation of jobs and the reduction of vulnerabilities. Uh, 
These investments are low cost and safe to store carbon and provide a global service to humanity. Furthermore, transitioning to a resilient and low carbon economy is a strong driver of economic recovery and the implementation of 2030 uh, agenda. That's what we are doing here and that's what we are supporting as uh, technical assistance and in international cooperation with uh, several countries here in Latin America and the Caribbean region. Thank you, Aneta. Luis, and you're from? <laughs> you forgot to mention that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm working for ICLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, and I'm working for the Sustainable Division in Human Settlements uh, uh, inside the ICLAC. I'm based in Santiago, Chile. Thank you very much for being this early morning hour with us. And uh, what you shared is <laughs> very, very much aligned with what Dechen mentioned and what asked, actually ESCAP is promoting as well. Uh, we are very much aligned and nature-based solutions are a fantastic option, a first instance option for CDR for us. And they have the inclusive, the social, economic and other impacts um, which are very pertinent for our region. Um, so thank you very much for that. I see this brotherhood here uh, very well developed. Now I would like to go to our next speaker, um, Oliver Geddon, who is going to, I would like to ask you, Oliver, to give us a perspective on where does CDR stand in the European Union policies? Uh, what are the, dis the discussions currently now? And because the they're, they're actually forming a trend, right, worldwide. So if, if you could inform us about that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Anita, maybe uh, Nigel can so, show the first slide because then you can easily see what uh, the European Union is, uh, is, is trying to do because we started to integrate carbon dioxide removal into, let's say, climate policy planning uh, do you see a trajectory developed by the European Commission uh, for the EU 28, so the UK is still included, uh, for net zero pathway by 2050? Uh, and what you see that net zero mainly, of course, means uh, emissions reductions in, in a conventional way. Uh, so everything you see above the zero line, but you see in 2050, you still have residual emissions. Uh, and the blue ones are non-CO2 emissions, and they're coming mainly from agriculture. We heard that uh, today quite often. So methane, nitrous oxide uh, are very hard to eliminate. Uh, and below the zero line, you see uh, in the red two types of carbon dioxide removal. The one, uh, LULUCF, land use, land use change in forestry, uh, and carbon removal technologies like direct air capture combined. Uh, with, with carbon capture and storage uh, and, and geological storage. So uh, what many surprises even the European Union, then if you see a, a, a figure like that, that in a way we're already doing carbon dioxide removal because we have a net uh, land sink. It's mainly forestry because starting in the 1990s, uh, uh, European Union, especially in the eastern parts, but also in, in, in countries like Germany, started uh, with, with quite substantial uh, afforestation programs. So what the change is, we, we start not only looking at what's happening above the zero line, but also what's happening below the zero line. And the numbers are quite substantial. So it would be in, 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 that, in that planning, 500 to 600 million tons uh, of carbon dioxide removal in 2050, which is kind of 10% uh, of our 1990 emissions. But this is the current think, uh, thinking. We need to get to net zero. I mean, you already mentioned that many countries are thinking like that. Uh, we have to reduce emissions drastically, but now we also start uh, to talk about um, carbon dioxide removal. Uh, and there was one major change uh, with the new 2030 target for the European Union. Uh, you, you might know that we uh, strengthened that uh, recently, but now we are really accounting for forestry within that target. Because the funny thing is, while we were doing afforestation at a very large scale, we never 
we of course accounted for it. There are accounting rules for that. They are not perfect, but there are accounting rules for that. But we never, let's say, took them into account when talking about do we reach our targets. Now they are included. There's criticism about that because then a minus 55% uh, target in the old way for 2030 doesn't mean the same if you have two or three percentage points um, of, uh, of forestry in there. Uh, and for the removal technologies or for, let's say, some unusual uh, uh, ecosystem-based solutions, um, the European Commission now also starts a process for certification scheme because it's because the suite of technologies is quite broad. You could 10, have 10 or 15 different ones, uh, also different locations uh, you might use, want to use different ones. You need certification schemes, you need monitoring, you need reporting, you need verification. Uh, so I would say the, the European Union is at a point where the integration uh, starts into mainstream climate policy and where all the usual questions about how to deal with new technology, with new approaches, uh, already enter not only the political sphere, but also the bureaucratic sphere of accounting and, and what can you do, what kind of incentives do you in, uh, develop. And, and maybe the last word, although it's not a European Union member anymore, uh, the United Kingdom, in fact, is the most advanced country right now in the European Union, maybe even worldwide, in thinking about carbon dioxide removal. They already not only have research programs, but also announced demonstration programs where they uh, where they now incentivize uh, pilot projects uh, in uh, across a, a very broad range from engineered to to ecosystem based. Uh, I think it's like twenty five project just to start trying what would work and what uh, might not work. Thank you. You're still muted, Anita. <laughs> yes, sorry. I click and then it's gone. Uh, yes, sorry about that. Thank you very much, Oliver, for this very interesting intervention. And we learned a lot about the um, issues that are being discussed in the European Union, the accounting of um, afforestation, the certification schemes for different carbon dioxide removal uh, approaches, um, and uh, from technology to na nature-based. Uh, this is good. And now the example you gave about UK with 20 five projects already on the ground is, is really prompting us that we need to really work more on the regulatory side and we need to have more governance uh, approach to it, uh, more transparency, accountability discussion, because uh, the impact will be global as it's the climate change is a global impact, right? So this is very good uh, information and um, it's going to continue pushing our dialogue regionally and globally. Um, now I would like to uh, turn to Jan and to ask him to give us the perspective of the young people, of uh, his colleagues, of people, um, of what they're discussing about CDR. Um, what is your, can you gauge that? What is the, the level of discussion among the non, let's say, involved, professionally involved uh, into the climate negotiations or climate meetings, people. It's very interesting to hear. Um, yes, thank you very much, Jen. Thank you so much, Aneta. I'm um, hearing the different speakers uh, or different panelists in uh, to, for today's uh, discussion. It's it's giving me sometimes chills or sometimes like, what are they talking? You know, if if I have to remove the hat of of someone who is attached right now in WMO and in C2G as an intern. I can say like, what are they talking? This is like, um, you know, a very big discussion. I, and I don't even know if this topic is being talked in the, in the youth space. But of course, for me, as someone who has deeper knowledge, I can, I can see the importance and relevance to it in, 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 in discussing about climate change. So I, I think in, in, the, in the youth sector, one of the biggest um, gaps uh, in, the, in, the, in the climate movement is either lack of information misinformation, lack of technical knowledge, or lack of capacity. So 
uh, climate change to me is very very personal it's not just about because i i, I want to be part of the bandwagon you know uh, and then be part of the of the climate activism i survived one of the havoc effects of climate change that's why it brought me to the movement so in the local context meaning from my province in Leyte, philippines climate change discussion exists but carbon dioxide removal or any other information related to it is not yet available for public consumption. It, it, might, it might be available, it may be available, but perhaps in, in higher institutions that offers environmental related degrees or programs. So now if we talk about how the decisions of carbon dioxide removal could impact my life or our life in general, in a subjective perspective, it's a matter of life and death a do or die situation. The, the effects of climate change is really affecting us and we are facing a real time ecocide. So if, if we believe in the science of climate, it is the IPCC one, um, 1 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius report makes clear how rapidly um, reductions need to be achieved to avoid or limit any overshoot of the 1.5 degrees temperature limit um, on the carbon dioxide emissions um, we need to be approximately half by 2030 and reach uh, zero or lower by 2050. This means that carbon dioxide removal is an inevitable option if we are really serious in aiming our 2030 and 2050 targets. So in, in, the, in the global context, in, in, the, in the global youth movement, there is a minimal discussion or awareness about CDR. And we even have resistance from some youth organizations about this topic. I know some groups even conducted a signature campaign in rejecting the solution. So the worries from the young people is the possibilities of adverse effects. If we are going to the CDR pathway, they are scared, unsure, doubtful. I think this is where our institutions and international or UN organizations should focus on research and communication. If the young activists, um, if the young activists have this knowledge, if they are into this topic, I think we can lessen the noise fatigue. When I say noise fatigue, because I think 10 years ago, I'm younger, I'm 18. This is the same things that we are shouting on the streets, you know. But instead of the usual pressure buildup, maybe the young people will be in a position to influence our government to look at this solution. So Aneta, that is so far the current status in, in, the, in, the, in, the young, in, the, in the youth space. This is minimally discussed or sometimes the information is not yet even available in, in, our, in our side, talking in a normal young individual. Thank you very much, Jan, and that confirms exactly what uh, our observations are. Uh, we have um, a little bit more time, and I would like to go with some follow-up questions to our speakers. I mean, continuing to what the comments even from Jan were, um, Dech and Dear, can you share with us what are the current discussions on governance and financing challenges for land-based carbon removal approaches? In the, in the global community, uh, climate community negotiations. So thank you very much, Annette, for your questions on governance and financing challenges of some land-based carbon removal approaches. So if we start to think about, I mean, financing has been recognized as, um, as critical to determine the success or failure for the climate agenda. And if you start to look at um, climate financing and you start to look at um, the Paris Agreement and you look at 2.1c, you start to look at financing flows for low carbon climate resilient development. So it's not just what funds, international uh, vertical funds available to look at um, climate change. And so what this does is um, it does for the first time, it takes central banks to really to look at where are the financial flows. And I think the work that's come from the G20 on the climate related risk disclosure and uh, with the UNEF finance initiative, we have uh, you know banks and insurance companies 
actually doing stress testing of their portfolio to look at where the investments are. So this this is going to be critical. It's not, you know, do we have $100 billion to carry out adaptation and mitigation projects? But the issue is um, central banks, where do the funds go? Where, where does the finance go? Uh, you look at private sector, you look at climate-related risk disclosure, and we also look at where our pension funds go. I mean, where, where, is, where are the financial flows? But if we start, um, if we start, um, and maybe maybe if we start to look at biodiversity and land degradation conventions, and achieving the SDGs, I think what is critical is we we have to look at both biological diversity and climate change. And uh, this year at the 15 Conference of Parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity, we will have the Global Biodiversity Framework. So it's got to be ambitious and pragmatic. And we have to connect the dots between climate change and biodiversity. If you've looked at, and I know that the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and they've actually started to look at, um, look at, I mean, many, many of the instruments in terms of uh, biodiversity conservation, looking at land-based sources, and where, where some of, some of the areas they've looked at, and um, if, if I could just say they've looked at non-market, market-based instruments, they've looked at payment for ecosystem services, biodiversity offset schemes, blue carbon sequestration, cap and trade programs, green bonds, trust funds, new legal instruments. But what we're hearing uh, from countries is that the land-based conservation, um, you can't get resources for it. And if you look at uh, baselines, um, you know, for all growth forests, you don't have the financing for it. So we need to start to look at some of the debt for nature swaps. You need to start to look at what you can do there. The, the other aspect about financing, and there's quite a lot of work that's being done now with national budgets. We've been doing climate tagging. And if you start to work with ministries of finance, you start to look at disaster risk reduction, and you start to look at investing through the national budgets, you're able to make a stronger case with the ministries of finance, with the treasury, with the central banks. So my so when you start to look at you know carbon dioxide removal, we really have to go beyond can I access uh, financing for projects? It has to go where are the financial flows going? Are the financial you know when we had Mark Carney talk about you know climate change, uh, you need the Financial Stability Board to talk about climate change. You need central banks to talk about climate change. So the approach uh, has to be um, has to be bigger, and the approach can't be getting ministries of finance coming to a conference of parties to talk about climate change. It's really looking at the fundamentals. And here, a lot of the work with natural capital accounting, look at ecosystem services. I mean, some of the basic basic work in terms of environmental accounting becomes really important. Thank you, Annette. Thank you very much, Ashin. This is, uh, this is really very, very good for reminding us that uh, we need the central banks in the core of that discussion with climate finance and focusing on the swaps for nature, debt uh, swaps for nature, debt swaps for climate is actually a uh, green post-COVID reduction pathway as well. Uh, and it's very timely, especially for these developed countries. And all the economic instruments to support nature-based solutions, um, which is basically the first very good step to carbon capture. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for this um, reminder. Um, Joyshree, um, I would like to come back to you because uh, we have similar uh, issues with the research on governance uh, for the CGR. Um, it, is, it in, is it enough? Is it enough, the research? Um, what more we need to focus on? Um, and the interlinkages that you mentioned before on ecosystems, um, how, how can governments do this and they need to put more effort right can you tell us a little bit more on that 
Yeah, but you know, again, I would I would say that uh, when we look at the climate action, it is very important, and I would like to reiterate all the time that we just cannot look into one option. You know, I mean, that's the mistake we will be doing. Um, because all the reports are clearly showing that we have to look at the portfolio of action, the whole bunch of actions together. And from that point of view, even 1.5 report also you know, shows that it is possible to um, mitigate uh, in such a way so that you might not need to go beyond just um, uh, the reforestation or afforestation. So there is a pathway for the whole world to decide whether they want to go for high cost uh, technological intervention more and more for CDR, or they want to mitigate more, which are less costly. So when we talk of finance, we need to be really looking for where lies the least cost option, where lies the most benefit. And from that point of view, you just cannot look into the CDR and how we can get the money for CDR, but we should look at it as a whole group of actions with mitigation and the CDR and what kind of CDR and in what time scale and how the money will be flowing. Because we must remember that um, it, 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 I mean, in 1.5 report, we could show it very clearly that even by looking into the mitigation options in the supply side and add to it the demand side responses, energy efficiency and uh, many other demand reduction, waste reduction and many of those behavioral measures which you can include in the societal scale and where you can generate more action and which are less costly. And then you reduce the demand for CDR more and more. So when you talk of financing, you really need to see that how you can reduce the demand for CDR and so that you mitigate more and you do. And we are now seeing even in the sixth assessment cycle that from the demand side intervention, you can reduce the need for CDR a lot. So because unless we make these choices at the societal scale, we will not be able to say that how much money need to go to for CDR, right? So this is very important. I don't think we have done those research well. So it might be that we might be putting in money in something which we could easily uh, do more uh, least, co least cost option way and more benefit. And then secondly, what I would suggest is also that that is something very important that we need to understand that when I just, I just gave an example from the ocean base because this is becoming more and more uh, uh, in the discussion nowadays. And where I want to say that many of the risks that can emerge from different interventions in the ocean system uh, will actually require local level research. What it means for the local environmental and societal impact and prior research are essential to avoid worsening of inequalities and creation of new social injustices. You know, In one of our recent review, what we found that women are very much involved in traditional coastal ecosystem and forest ecosystem also based economic activities. And so there is almost no studies which looks into the distributional impact from the gender perspective while making a transition to this blue economy or to the CDR based economies, you know. So it is very important to look into that because otherwise uh, the injustice will be doubled to the uh, to the already disadvantaged group. So it's uh, just the climate action cannot be supported unless there is a justice in transition. So you cannot expect inclusive participatory process unless there is justice is ensured. And so I'll give one more example that seabed storage can, I mean, theoretically, geophysically, it can, I mean, it's, um, it, I mean, it, it can happen in the territorial uh, water, but then there is need for scientific understanding if these technologies are going to be used safely or without unintended 
consequences, like what um, it has been said that the youths are against these. Why? Because there is less information available. Scientific information is not provided to them. It's not only that it's not provided, it's not known. Even the scientists do not agree on all these different range of technologies and how safe they are on different ranges, right? So this is something very important that this research is made more clear and uh, accessible to all. And even for the carbon storage in the seabed requires significant further research before it is ready to safely make a substantive contribution to solving the climate problem. So I would say that when we talk of SDGs, it is 2030 target, then I would say that our focus and finance need to be more on uh, you know, the actual implementation of the mitigation and adaptation options. And then we need to look for longer term, but then starting now the research on the other carbon dioxide removal options or how we can minimize that by mobilizing the societal uh, um, responses on the demand side so that we can have less CDR requirement for in the future. Thank you very much, Ayushree. These were very, very passionate and I, I, I like all your comments, of course, definitely demand side management mitigation. Uh, but I would like still to go back to what Dechen said, that we need to know where the monies are going. National money should not go for fossil fuels anymore and for fossil fuel subsidies. And one of the good tools is carbon pricing. So we could really curb our mitigation. So 2030 agenda implementation gives us a chance to do a lot of that mitigation, adaptation, and also prevention. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I would like now to go to Luis back, and maybe Luis, you could inform us, um, uh, if possible, um, short and um, maybe just sort of point. How is the your commission addressing the governance challenge? Um, in your region, which is more homogeneous than ours, basically. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's a, a very uh, good question, and it uh, is in, in a very important one. Uh, uh, we uh, we we are trying to use this uh, concept of environmental big push, and the general idea around this uh, this uh, a big push is to is the, the coordination of policies, and this is the main idea. So uh, actually, uh, we are not trying to to create or or, or to use uh, or to push for new economic instruments, because uh, we we are just trying to work with what we already have, and this is uh, one of uh, uh, one of the consequences. This is to uh, increase the level of of governance. So uh, the idea of coordinating uh, the coordination of policies is to uh, how we could transform the fiscal policies. So we have a, 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 a potential of transformation in, in, in the, the, the current fiscal policies that we must use that. Uh, we must review the incentives and the good ones and the bad ones. Uh, we need to reorient the public budgets because most of the times we uh, there is there's is no such a thing like we uh, is lacking money that we do not have money to invest uh, most of the times is how we are investing uh, 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 our our money how the uh, how, how we are financing uh, uh, projects and and what we are doing with the money that we we have so if we uh, uh, if we succeed to coordinate a little bit better the current policies, meaning a better fiscal policies, a better set of incentives, a, a, a huge reorientation of the uh, public budgets that we have at local level, at regional level, at national level. This uh, uh, the the and if you are linking everything uh, uh, in a coherent uh, uh, direction, you really uh, get uh, a good uh, 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 strength 
to uh, promote uh, changes and really reorient the uh, the current policies that we have and the reorient the, the economic development. Uh, so uh, 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 more than trying to create new instruments, I, we think that we could generate some a, a, a governance, a better governance through the uh, uh, through the uh, uh, coordination of policies. So this is the, the the main idea that we are trying to apply, and we are applying that for uh, 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 sustainable uh, mobility, circular economy, uh, 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 ecosystem based uh, uh, adaptation. Uh, so uh, a set of policies that could generate this uh, transition for a sustainable society that could facilitate our our uh, uh, need to promote uh, uh, a green recovery. We are living in a pandemic situation. We need to build a resilient and a low carbon economy and at the same time generate uh, millions and millions of new jobs. So this uh, for reaching these goals, we need to uh, act more uh, in a more strong way in the coordination of policies and get everything done at the same time. Uh, this is the, the idea that we are trying to work for uh, behind of this is the theory of the environmental big push. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, very much aligned with uh, our policies currently as well, um, where we are also focusing on nature-based solutions for recovery and uh, for creating jobs uh, for the opportunities for growth there. Uh, now I would like to go back to um, Oliver and just to bring another dimension of the current uh, dialogue. Uh, some of the countries, um, let's say India, for example, mentioned that at the latest UN conference that the rich countries need to go beyond net zero and they need also to look into negative removing carbon. So maybe that is now the big push uh, coming from some developing countries, especially from our region for CDR. But um, then what can you say uh, on this? Um, what are the, the potential threats there if diverting finances from supporting low development countries into CDR? Is that really good? And um, what, is, what are the negative implications? And what are the governance issues? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, it's it's an interesting development, but uh, but but many saw it coming. If you have a global net zero target, like we have, kind of uh, we ha we have that vision. It's also in the Paris Agreement. Then, of course, the question is: uh, Do all countries need to meet that at the same time? Of course not. That would not be fair. Uh, and and that's what brought uh, I think India's energy minister to say, well, I mean. We still have time to get there, and uh, and maybe the the OECD countries uh, should not only be there first. I think that's that's already clear. Many have uh, 2050 targets for net zero, but then also go net negative, which which sounds a little bit outrageous to already talk about net negative, although the IPCC pathways uh, kind of assume that we go there globally. And uh, and and if you remember my slide. Uh, uh, net zero only, or net zero means having the same amount of removals then of emissions, and it will come mainly from reducing emissions and scaling up removals a little, uh, and to get net negative by just doing more CDR and reducing your emissions further, which will be possible even after net zero. But it could become kind of a distraction then if OECD countries, developed countries, start talking about net negative already, let's say, in the second half of the century, uh, instead of pushing the emissions down right now, their own emissions and pushing finance up. So it could become a distraction, a promise for the future. And it sounds great. Or we, 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 we're going to get net negative because at some point you might see that a country excuses his uh, its inaction by saying, well, we will make up for this later by going net negative. Uh, that, of course, would be... Uh, uh, would be detrimental. Uh, similar to now saying, okay, we can go net zero by just pushing up CDR and continue to emit like we did, with something we see uh, with many companies who are now investing in offsetting schemes where you have the feeling, okay, they, they don't intend to reduce their emissions. And that's just 
intent to buy into imaginary carbon dioxide removal. And that of course needs to be uh, avoided. Net zero and net negative will mainly come uh, from reducing emissions, but of course it depends on upscaling CDR as well. But I think the focus still has to be uh, on emissions reduction. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, Jan, um, I would like back to come to you. Um, what would you like to take account for the governments for? What are they missing in this intergenerational uh, discussions that we have here and also with relations to carbon removal? Yeah, just to unleash a little activist in me, I would say, uh, are they even thinking? You know, even the simple NDC and the Paris Agreement, we faced a lot of issues moving forward. So, uh, I mean, <clears throat> going back to our topic, for me, our, our policymakers should think less on the economic gains because I think one of the great barriers in moving forward in any solutions that we are providing scientifically is barred by the economic perspective. Like, you know, we need to be rich in the next few years. But, you know, there will be no economic development in the next 10 to 30 years if we are facing a planetary crisis. And if we will be facing, if we will be spending so much in disaster response, for me, it's, it's not a rational thinking. So as, as of the moment, the usual move of our policymakers are geared towards cutting emissions, and it will not be enough if we want to maintain a habitable and sustainable planet. So in my perspective as, as, as a young um, activist or a young activist is uh, they should support um, CDR if, if, if the science supports it, you know, if this is a good uh, pathway to, to help us address the climate crisis, the policymakers should help in allocating financial resources for its research and implementation, ASAP. It shouldn't be just in 2035, you know? And of course, as mentioned earlier, if uh, Joy Shuri um, and I were mentioning about lack of information and some not, and even not available to the public, the government will maybe in, is, will in, in a good position to help us inform the public, educate the public, so we can have um, support as well in, in maybe, you know, nature-based solutions. Maybe the, the young people can, can be in the position to, to help us implement this one. So I think for me, um, intergenerational justice issues, or, you know, it's, it's a matter of stop, stop the sub, um, economic uh, mindset first, because I think that is the, really the biggest barrier. Thank you very much, John. This was very, very, very good intervention. I look at the chats and we have a lot of interesting uh, statements, comments, and what comes to my attention very strongly is um, uh, the call from our participants, uh, attendees, to to look more for nature protection, nature conservation, and to push the private sector to go into that direction rather into technologies and uh, more technological uh, innovation. So we, we need a stronger governance, I guess, that will help us to um, bring more uh, nature conservation, parks, green areas, bringing the ecosystems approaches. Um, who would like also to give a comment on this because this is the private sector we need to think of uh, how to involve them more uh, who wants to give a go for it Joy okay uh, what I would think is that you know though when we talk of the nature-based solution I mean for a very long time there has been uh, this discussion in the environmental economics and in ecological economics uh, space that how you introduce the payment for ecosystem services, right? So how you make it a livelihood option for people and a livelihood option is not about the poor people's job, you know, so that you really make a good living out of making the nature-based conservation, whether you will call it conservation or different kind of uh, programs we need to see, right? So if it is mangrove protection, and then um, say um, Amazonian forest uh, reserve maintenance, 
how are you going to work out a payment for ecosystem services? Who pays for it? Where is the benefit? So that, that discourse, we are not discussing at all because we have never talked about, you know, managing a global common and how do we think as global economy for that? I do agree that we should not be talk of, talking of economy, but I think this is also a very, um, very uh, a partial approach that economy will be there. How we can make it more complete where it is missing and uh, so that we can broaden the scope of a human well-being measurement going beyond just GDP measurement or income measurement is something which we need to look into. So how we can bring in the uh, well-being concept, payment for ecosystem services, nature-based uh, solutions as a mainstream economic activities and which shows up in economic progress indicator are very important. So as it has been said that natural resource accounting, how we can bring in. So there are multiple things that need to happen and just not, just not one single action. So from, from that point of view, I think these are the discourses and these are the, um, these are the methods which needs to be taught also, you know, so education system really need to uh, gear towards these new things. It's just not the old things that, so new uh, courses, new capacity building, these are very important. Capacity building is not just top up, you know, it should be real education. And so that's something which is very important and which um, uh, our young friend already said that youths are not yet really trained appropriately to understand what is going to happen. So I think these are the ways where we should be really putting our hands on. Thank you very much, Oishri. And uh, Dechen, I saw your hand. You wanted to, to, to mention something? Thank, thank you, Aneta. Um, Aneta, when we brought forests into climate change, it was when there's a coalition of countries that came up with reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. So we had countries and then they came up with targets. Today we have, uh, you know, the peatlands and a group of countries that are very rich in peatlands. You look at Peru, um, Indonesia, Republic of Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, and they're really looking at how do you conserve peatlands and how do you bring it into the nationally determined contributions. One of the, you know, the, the silver lining with the global COVID-19 pandemic is it shows us that we need to make peace with nature. And as my colleague Jan says, it shows us that if you don't make peace with nature, the economic consequences are devastating. And then that brings home the fact that climate crises will be devastating. So for the first time, there is an opportunity to look at you know, when we make peace with nature, what does this mean for us? And for those of us who've been on the margins of, you know, talking about conservation, protection, you know, the moral imperative, we actually have a really sound economic uh, argument. And I think really this is an opportunity for all of us to be able to go forward. Because when we start to look at the climate crises, I mean, you look, you saw what, you know, COVID-19 pandemic did to us for 18 months. It's continuing to do for us. Look at what's going to happen to climate. You're going to have disasters, no fresh water, uh, agriculture, diseases, um, migration, refugees. We're going to have it at a scale. And I think for the first time, um, you know, the general public actually realizes what this could mean. Thank you, Netta. Very, very good point, Stachin, bringing us to the reality of life. Um, mm -hmm. I, may I, yes, may I Louis, contribute yes. to the point? Yes, please, uh, please, please. Uh, <laughs> okay, no, thank you. Thank you. No, I, I'm just thinking uh, the importance of uh, uh, 
promoting a, 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 the transition for sustainability. And this transition should be better planned. Uh, we know what uh, we know what we we need to do. Uh, we we have the enough technologies. We have uh, human resources to do to, to promote the this transition. Uh, but we are not doing very well in in organizing uh, a strategy for this transition to overcome the initial barriers. Uh, some of these barriers are uh, just ideological. Others are financial. Others uh, really need a, a special uh, a process to overcome legal issues or, or, or the transformation of the, the, the fiscal policies, allowing the new to appear and to the old to the old uh, process to gone. So uh, this uh, a, a better preparation, a better strategy. Uh, in a coordinated strategy, I think it's quite important, and this this is something that we are not doing very well because uh, we know what we to, we need to do to in order to promote a, a energy transition. We know what we need to do to uh, preserve uh, and restore the productive capacity of the soils and and to have a good productivity of water. Uh, a supply, uh, a sustainable supply of water. We know how to do that from a technical point of view. But uh, uh, when it comes to how to organize the political process for this transformation, this is we need to, to think uh, better, to uh, organize better with governments and, and include uh, uh, the private sector, the civil society, and have a better uh, uh, a better strategy for this transition. This is really uh, something that we need to uh, put some effort and devote some energy for this. Thank you, Luis. Uh, Oliver, I know that you're burning also to, to make a comment. Yeah, I, I just want to comment on, on, on the, let's say, the, how do we distinguish certain approaches? And I think what, what, what many... Uh, have been calling nature-based solutions. I think it's mainly about avoiding further degradation and further, let's say, emissions. It's not necessarily about removing. Uh, of course it is as well, but at, at the same time, the, the carbon stored will be quite vulnerable uh, to reversal, as we all know, also in a, in a warming climate. So I think in, in, in science, the debate is moving towards how durable is the carbon storage actually? Uh, and uh, although we don't have much expectation with geological, deliberate geological storage, it is deemed to be more durable. Also, there are options in between, like enhanced mineral weathering, uh, where you wouldn't see uh, also a natural uh, chemical process where you wouldn't see that kind of uh, risk for, for impermanence. So I think we have to look at it uh, uh, Effort by effort, also region by region, but it's very clear that ecosystem-based uh, measures will have much more local co-benefits, and that's also a good reason why to do it. Oliver, thank you very much, Oliver. We are uh, um, uh, informed that we will be getting soon cut. Um, I just want um, to catch up with what uh, Dechen said, making peace with nature tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock Banco time, 11 o'clock Japanese time or GMT plus 9. Please join the session three of track one, um, where SCAP is leading a whole big debate for two hours of very fantastic speakers. And um, yes, thank you very much for all the panelists of uh, joining. This was fantastic. And I, this will be uh, streamed on the YouTube and people can uh, see it further and um, uh, also share their their views, um, please go to the website of the SDG Help Desk, where you have a lot of condensed and interesting information that uh, you could use um, uh, in your work or your advocacy. And we uh, invite the young people to join and to learn more and uh, why uh, also investing in also in fossil fuels to capture the carbon there rather than only new technologies, right? Um, so uh, with that, I think we're reaching almost the end, right? Support team? Yes. 
<laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. It has been a very rich discussion. Or oh, I, I, uh, I didn't intend to make any substantive points, just uh, as a follow up, as Anita said, we will send some key takeaways from our discussion today to the organizers of the Climate Week. And also I shared some uh, links for if you want to uh, find further resources on this topic. Uh, lastly, I would, uh, I would like to say a huge thank you to all of our uh, distinguished speakers and colleagues from ASCAP and from C2G who are behind the thing and who have made this event uh, successful. And to finally, to all of you who have participated in this event. Um, so with that said, we, we close this event. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much.